everybody. It's Mike Preston at New Harbor Financial Group. It is Thursday, January 18th, and we're here this week to give you some data and some insight that hopefully you can use and that'll uh, give you some purpose in, in what you're doing in the investment world. And in this week's little snippet, we wanted to talk a little bit about analysis paralysis. The really cool thing about the market is that it is an infinite universe. It's why I first fell in love with it way back in the 90s. It is an infinite universe where you can express an infinite number of opinions. So this is really neat. Uh, it's very engaging and it's a lifelong study for me. And it's also what draws so many people to it. However, the fact that it's an infinite universe is also a trap because we have our own emotions, our own fears, or our own greed that continually gets in the way one way or another it gets in the way of making good decisions and it's easy to get so trapped in analysis that it's difficult to really have a system or a way of looking at things i would say if one thing is more important than anything it's having some kind of system or a list of rules or patterns or whatever it is for you that says this is an opportunity you also need something that tells you that this opportunity is continuing to be a good opportunity or this opportunity is not working out. So essentially that's what it is. You have to take an infinite universe down to a small list of opportunities, then execute on those opportunities and have an exit plan for if it doesn't work out. So I think that's what people look to us for, our clients. They look for us to take our experience with our system, with our list of rules and make some decisions on how to participate in the market. The things that we use uh, to build a watch list are really not as 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 long as you think. It's not a it's not a list of 300 parameters, for instance. Now that's not to say that can't work. There's some people running systems with 300 or 500 different variables in there and there's a lot of work on Wall Street with PhDs trying to do essentially that, to get an edge on each other. And that can work. That's not us though. What we do is we take a look at um, the top down, start with the big picture. What do the fundamentals look like? That has been relatively challenging for us in, in recent years. For five years or more, the fundamentals have been really bad. Uh, the things like valuations, most importantly, valuations. Va valuations do drive long-term returns. And no matter what happens in the short term, valuations like Schiller price earnings ratio, stock market cap to GDP, and a whole bunch of others. Price to sales even is a metric that that uh, we would look at. But more, more than anything, it's a good valuation metric like a Schiller price earnings ratio. So that backdrop has been very negative for a very long time. The market's changed since the global financial crisis, uh, which bottomed in 2009. Since then, central banks have continued to print money at every little dip in the market. And now, pretty much the market thinks that they can never fail. They will fail. We don't know when. We don't know better than anybody else when that will happen, when there will be some kind of reversion in the market. We've had a lot of small reversions along the way. In 2022, we had roughly a 20% pullback in the S&P, but that was immediately reversed in 2023. And here we sit right near the ultimate or the or, or the top of the market up to this point, I should say. And it looks to us like near-term indicators are saying that there might be one more leg higher. None of that negates the fact that the fundamentals are terrible and that the uh, the bad results are baked in the cake over the next 10 years, let's say. Uh, I don't think there's any way to make a positive return in this market from these levels. So that's the macro. But then we, we we have to drill down into what are we going to do today, even though the environment is bad. The weather is bad, but we still have to go outside. Uh, so it's really a matter of degrees in that sense. And right now, our very near-term indicators are positive. So we're up roughly in the high 30-something percent range in terms of equity exposure. Well, how do we pick that equity exposure? We have a lot of different tools, but we use... Uh, primarily relative strength analysis to take a look at what sectors are doing better than others. So we have tools that we can take all the sectors in the S&P 500 
And separately, we can take all the countries in the world and we can pop all of these things into a matrix and see what floats out on top. Uh, we have learned over a long period of time, and I've learned over decades, that it's best to pick leaders. Now, there's some exceptions to this. We might bottom fish sometimes in certain things, but by and large, we prefer, we prefer to buy things that are working. And relative strength analysis tells you what's working. So we will take a look at uh, matrices. We'll take a look at thumbnail charts of various different sectors. We'll take a look at how they're performing versus the market. And right now we see a handful of things like insurance and industrials. And even semiconductors are on that list. They're not in our portfolio. Some other tech stocks are on that list, but they're not in our portfolio either because they're very extended. Well, we noticed uranium uh, and uranium miners a few months ago were had very high relative strength. That's why we added that. So we take an infinite universe. We're looking for the best of the best, and we come up with a few sectors. Now we have to we have to temper that with our macro outlook. Our macro out outlook is very grim, so we're not going to go one hundred percent into anything, or certainly into stocks. If we had a massive washout in the market and there was a great reset, so to speak, we would probably be nearly 100% in stocks. But right now, we're in the high 30s, and even that amount is hedged. So we're very reluctant to go deeper at this point, or more committed than we are, no matter what the different sector work says. But you know, right now, we're, we're, we've got a handful of sectors in there, and if we see something stronger, we'll kick one out and put another one in. We're adding Japan as well, based on this work. We're noticing that in the international uh, arena, Japan has, has a great looking uh, chart pattern. It's broken out of a base. And I can actually show you the chart here. So this is the iShares MSCI Morgan Stanley Composite Index Japan ETF. We're very interested in non-US stocks. We think that the epicenter of the bubble is in US stocks demographics in Japan are, are broadly improving. But the way that this came up on our radar is the sector work and the region work that we do, looking at all of the different thumbnails uh, or full-size charts and taking a look at how it, uh, one, uh, one chart or one group performs versus others. But this is exactly what you want to see for a base breakout. Each one of these dark columns or gray columns is a year so this chart goes back about 10 years it was going sideways for a long period of time a few years ago it broke out but that tent ended up being a failure as it round tripped down here but over the last couple of years japan has based out sideways on a flat base and we got a nice breakout here and we just added this position right about at 80 85 on this what we would call double top breakout it's only a 4% position. It's not a big bet, but this is the type of thing that we're constantly looking to do. Uh, I should reiterate that it's not a big bet. In an infinite universe, you can make all kinds of choices, including uh, making an all-in bet or an even leverage bet. What we're doing here is very risk controlled, and I would suggest that people do the same. Have a plan for what to do if it doesn't work out. For instance, if this doesn't work out and it breaks down, we'll get out of it. If it moves higher and then consolidates and then breaks out again, we might very well add to the position and make it larger. So add to your winning positions. Don't stick with something that's losing unless it's something that is a fundamental part of your portfolio that you, that you completely um, uh, just believe in for the long term fundamentally. For instance, we recommend 5 to 10% gold bullion. That's not something that you should sell just because we have a drop or something like that. That's less tactical. But this is tactical, and this is how we make decisions, and we're constantly looking for different ideas, and we're, you know, we're looking at this all week, all the time, and this is how we're coming up with ideas. If something gets very extended or goes straight up without pause, we'll probably sell calls against it to hedge. So just thought I'd share a little insight into how you can start to build some ideas, um, how you can narrow down the funnel from an infinite universe to a, to a more focused list. That's how we do it. The last thing I guess I'd say is that 
the market here has been pretty flat for the last week or two after a, a huge finish to 2023 we're consolidating we don't see any signs that it's rolling over or crashing just yet we're alert if it does we have plans in place and we're well positioned for it but we're also positioned to hopefully participate a little bit if this continues just a little bit more uh, we've tightened some of our hedges just in case that happens uh, but in the meantime, it's, this is a waiting game. And with Treasury bills paying above 5% still, uh, we get paid to wait as well. So thank you so much. Again, this is Mike Preston at New Harbor Financial. I enjoyed this. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we will talk to you soon. See you next week.